Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. We have a great docket. Let's get to it. First, the threat of imminent incarceration tends to break the bonds of loyalty. And so it begins in the Alex Baldwin shooting. Will Alec Murdoch get to keep his property? Halloween costume or getaway disguise? Didn't want that nurse treating me in the ICU. Another air assault? The ultimate theft by deception. How can you abandon your children and nobody notice? And then our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased, true crime channel, the channel where a practicing criminal defense attorney explains the facts, the procedure, and the law in regards to cold cases and current true crime criminal cases. Welcome to the show. Now, if you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, hit that little bell so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. And as always, remember, if you can't watch us, you can always listen to us on your favorite podcasting app. Please download Crime Talk and listen to not only this episode, but all of the past episodes as well. All right, before we get to the show, let's talk about the people that help support this show. That's right, they're called sponsors, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, they help keep the lights on here at Crime Talk. And today it's crimetalksearch.com. Please go to crimetalksearch.com and I'm telling you, Once you do this, once you try this, you will be glad you did and you won't give it up. We use a background subscription service here in our law firm every day. When witnesses pop up, we don't really know anything about them, guess what? We do a background search. And I would say nearly every time we do a search, we find out something we didn't know. In today's world, you hear about of so many situations where somebody meets somebody online, they meet them and well, you know, two people go on a date and only one comes back. Well, that is dating malpractice if you don't check these people out. And just a random Google search isn't going to be good enough. Go to crimetalksearch.com. You're going to get a report while you wait, and it is going to give you information about whether there's any bankruptcies, any property records, um, divorce records, marital records, criminal convictions, and whether they are sex offenders. And there's more. I'm telling you, go to crimetalksearch.com. You can cancel at any time, but you're not going to want to do that. Think of all the people you come in contact with. Wouldn't you just like to check them out? Maybe you don't get a great feeling about them. You can find it out at crimetalksearch.com. All right, today is Friday, October 29th, 2021. Now, quick reminder, you can see the dumb criminal on YouTube shorts as well. So if you don't get the notification for the shorts, then you can find it uh, linked in the uh, pinned comments. And we're gonna be putting up shorts as well um, as to our daily program, so make sure you check it out. All right, as I said in the introduction, the threat of imminent incarceration tends to break the bonds of loyalty. I have seen people roll on family members and people that they thought they would never roll on simply because, well, they thought they were going to prison and it has begun in the Alex Baldwin shooting, okay? And, well, we should say murder. It was a murder. Let's call it what it was. Now, the lawyers for Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the head armorer for the rust uh, uh, shoot that was taking place, said in a statement that Hannah is devastated and completely beside herself over the events that have transpired. Now, as most people know, Alec Baldwin discharged a real gun. It was not a prop gun on this New Mexico movie set, which led to the death of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins and injury uh, director Joel Souza. Now, the attorney for the armor goes on and says, safety is Hannah's number one priority on the set. Ultimately, the set would never have been compromised if live ammo were not introduced. Hannah has no idea where the live rounds came from. And Gutierrez Reed and her lawyer are claiming the real culprit is the person who introduced the live rounds on the set. 
Well, there's a lot of people that have a lot of responsibility on the set. Clearly somebody who introduced those live rounds, the person responsible for making sure there were no live rounds in the gun, and ultimately the person who took the gun, who fired the gun, should have been aware what was in that gun. Well, the lawyers also say that the guns were locked up at night uh, and during lunch, which is also what Gutierrez Reed has originally told authorities. Now, her lawyers cast some blame on the producers. Of course, one of the producers is Alec Baldwin for overloading her with work on the set, saying that Gutierrez Reed was hired for two positions on this film, which made it hard for her to focus on her tasks. Apparently, another job on set was the uh, key assistant for the props. And let's call it for what it was. It's not a prop. It was a real gun. Okay. Now the lawyers say she fought for training days to maintain weapons and proper time to prepare for gunfire, but ultimately was overruled by the production uh, department. The whole production set became unsafe due to various uh, factors, including the lack of safety meetings. Now the statement also seems to acknowledge there were at least two misfires of the weapon in the days prior to the fatal shooting. And first, was fired by the prop master um, on set, and a second was a stuntman after Gutierrez Reed informed him that the gun was hot with blanks. As you can see, everyone is pointing the finger at everybody else because nobody wants to be responsible. I get it. I wouldn't want to go to prison either, but somebody's probably going to be charged, and they should be, okay? And I can't imagine why the attorneys are making statements. Um, although these are not coming, although these statements uh, may be consistent with what was said uh, to the authorities during interviews, still not good. These people need to lawyer up and they need to shut up and really nothing ever good comes from trying your case in the news media. It simply is not a good thing. It's never worked very well and at least in my humble opinion, I think they should all just keep their mouth shut and let the prosecution make the charging decisions if they're going to do that. And as we all know, the authorities still haven't announced whether criminal charges will be filed. Wait and see. They're obviously dotting their I's, crossing their T's before they do it because it's probably going to involve some, well, famous people. All right. Next on the docket, Alex Murdoch. Will he get to keep his own money or is somebody else going to manage his money? Well, a South Carolina judge is scheduled to hear argument today whether to freeze the assets of the disgraced attorney, Alex Murdoch, and appoint an attorney to act as a receiver of those assets. So this afternoon, Judge Daniel D. Hall will hear arguments from plaintiff's attorney, Mark Tinsley, who represents the family of Mallory Beach. And Tinsley is asking Hall to freeze Murdoch's assets and appoint two receivers, attorneys John T. Lay Jr. and former U.S. Attorney Peter M. McCoy Jr. to control those assets. The lawyer said Alex Murdoch could be hiding inheritance from the death of his wife and son in an unsolved shooting at the family's home in June or from his father's death from natural causes a few days later. They, are also, uh, they also said because Murdoch has been part of a legal empire in tiny Hampton County, South Carolina, he could have other money coming in from any number of sources. Well, last month, Murdoch gave control over his assets to his surviving son, Buster Murdoch, after Murdoch was involved in that bizarre alleged roadside shooting uh, in South Carolina in a scheme so that he could give his son some $10 million from an insurance policy that he would collect upon. Alex Murdoch's attorneys have not responded to the request to have the two lawyers review and catalog all of Murdoch's assets, which include bank accounts, insurance policies, and any expenditures that would have to be approved uh, for his spending. So ladies and gentlemen, this is obviously a civil matter, but the reality of this, this is what they call a pre-judgment attachment of assets. It's pretty tough to do in the civil world, so to speak, but you have to be able to show that you have a high likelihood of success and that the potential assets to be seized, well, they're basically fungible or they can be disposed of rather quickly and therefore they need protection. Now, given what has taken place with Alex Murdoch, it would seem like the judge would wanna do the safe thing, which is to appoint the receiver and put everything into this receivership and basically do an accounting and figure out what is there so that when basically the bill comes due, uh, the victims can be paid from the uh, Alex Murdoch assets if there are any. 
and he is probably going to have little to none for himself or his son when all is said and done after he probably serves a lengthy prison sentence. Unless, of course, you know, the courts give him a pass and gets a smoking good deal because, you know, maybe there's still a bit of a old boy network down there in uh, South Carolina. At least that's what it appears to be thus far. Now, doesn't it? All right. Halloween costume or getaway disguise? Well, 25-year-old Alex Ibarra Gomez led police on a chase and broke into a house until he eventually emerged from the house and was arrested while wearing a stolen Ricky Bobby costume from the Will Ferrell movie, Talladega Nights. Now, for those of you sophisticated people who have never seen Talladega Nights, this is probably one of the top 10 movies I've ever seen. It's absolutely stupid, ridiculous, but man, is it funny, all right? Well, the police received a report uh, from a witness about a black GMC driving recklessly and running stop signs in Beaver Lake, Oregon. The witness said uh, while they were trying to get close enough to read the license plate, a man later identified as Gomez stopped the vehicle, pointed a handgun out of his window, and shot toward the witness. That's right. That's a menacing and probably attempted murder. The witness ducked to avoid the gunfire and then shot back with a rifle. Thankfully, no one was injured during the exchange. Well, Gomez then fled into the uh, pickup again. Police later found the vehicle had been stolen from Salem, Oregon. Shocking. And there was also a woman in the truck. Well, the Oregon City Police then spotted Gomez driving on State Route 213 into oncoming traffic. They attempted to stop him, but they were unable to continue uh, pursuing Gomez because it was a residential area. So around 6.18 p.m., police found the GMC crashed into a detached garage of a home and received word from a witness that Gomez had fled the vehicle and ran into the woods. Now, police found a woman walking away from the site of the crash. They interviewed her and she was later released. Gomez, meanwhile, broke into a nearby home. Now, the homeowner was not home, but Gomez tripped the alarm, which alerted the police. The SWAT team members arrived, several police units, and a crisis negotiation team had arrived on the scene. The standoff ended about 9 p.m., about three hours after the initial call. Gomez ultimately surrendered peacefully from the house, wearing a NASCAR costume from the movie Talladega Nights, which, well, he had stolen while he was inside the house. Gomez had also stolen some other clothing items like jewelry, which he put in a suitcase. Gomez was taken to a hospital for evaluation and then booked into the Clackamas County Jail, where he was booked on several outstanding warrants, including attempted assault, attempt to elude a police officer, and burglary. This man is a one-man crime spree, no doubt. But I guess he was figuring, hey, they got to prove it was me. So maybe if they can't prove it was me because I was wearing the Talladega Nights and nobody saw me wearing Talladega Nights, they'll never figure it out. Or maybe they'll just figure it out that he stole it from inside the house. Mr. Gomez, good luck. Give you the presumption of innocence, but uh, not looking good so, so far. Okay, there's one thing they teach you in law school and torts classes that you don't sue nurses, right? You can sue doctors, but nobody ever sues nurses because they're very motherly. They're supposed to be the ones that are taking care of you. They nurture you, right? Well, take a listen to this story about this nurse. A jury has sentenced an ex-Texas nurse to death for taking the lives of four patients by injecting air into their arteries following heart surgery. Now, jurors agreed with the prosecutors that the 37-year-old cardiac ICU nurse, William George Davis, killed four patients at a Tyler hospital in 2017 and 2018. John Lafferty, Ronald Clark, Christopher Greenway, and Joseph Kalina suffered unexplained neurological problems and died while recovering from their heart surgeries at the Christus Mother Francis Hospital. Now, during the trial sentencing phase, prosecutors played for the jury telephone recordings from the jail shortly after the guilty verdict. In a call to his ex-wife, Davis said he would find ways to prolong patients' ICU stays so he could, well, make more overtime pay. Prosecution experts said the four victims showed signs of air in their brain, causing irreversible damage. Following the fourth death, surveillance footage showed Davis was the last individual to see the victim 
before his condition ultimately deteriorated. United States Secret Service agent John Day said that he analyzed a laptop that had a username connected to Davis and the analysis found searches done on the computer and saved on its hard drive. He said that the user either began looking for Mother Francis Hospital or searched Mother Francis Hospital investigating possible serial killer in March of 2018. Agent Day continued that someone on the same laptop viewed Wikipedia articles with a list of serial killers same day and looked at articles about serial killers on a cable news website. Well, I hope that's not going to get uh, any of us charged because there's a lot of crime talk aficionados that uh, I think do those searches as well. Anyway, the sentence was handed down one week after the jury found the man guilty of capital murder. Don't want him being your bedside nurse, that's for sure. Okay. And I don't understand what is going on in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, occasionally, you would hear about a dispute, an argument on an airline flight. Now it seems like it happens nearly daily. Please give the flight attendants and flight crew a break. I get it. Flight airline travel isn't like it used to be. When I was a kid, you actually wore a suit when you went on the airplane. It was a really big deal. And now, well, it's not. The only thing people care about, I don't know what they care about, but it's not being nice, but they crammed all the seats. Maybe it's the airline's fault because they crammed all the seats so damn close, and then they force you to buy first class, so you actually have some leg room, particularly if you're tall like me. I'm six foot three. I need leg room. You can't put people back there and them not get cranky, but still, no excuse to hit anybody. All right, we digress. So, an American Airlines flight attendant was diverted uh, the other evening after a passenger reportedly assaulted the flight attendant. Flight 976 departed from New York's JFK uh, International Airport and was headed to John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California. But the plane was diverted to Denver because of this incident. Law enforcement apprehended the passenger at the gate. According to American Airlines, the airline did not provide additional details or the flight attendant's condition. American Airlines released a statement saying the individual involved in this incident will never be allowed to travel with American Airlines in the future, but we will not be satisfied until he has been prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. This behavior must stop and aggressive enforcement and prosecution of the law is the best deterrent. That's according to Doug Parker, CEO of American. He says very disturbing downside to the increased air travel post pandemic era and that these instances of unruly behavior happen far too often. The passenger's identity has not been released and no details were immediately available. In a statement, the FBI said the investigation is ongoing and that no arrests have been made at this time, which is very, very odd to me. Uh, now, Mackenzie Rose, who was on the American Airlines flight, said she saw the flight attendant with blood on her face mask during the incident, which occurred while they were flying over Ohio and photographed the suspect after the emergency landing in Denver. Rose claimed on Twitter that the attack was over improper mask use. Reports of unruly behavior on planes, including violence against crew members, have increased since the start of the pandemic. And the FAA shows 923 investigations have been initiated this year into violations of the uh, regulations and federal law. As you may recall, in May, a Southwest Airlines flight attendant lost two teeth after a passenger punched her in the face and pulled her hair, um, according to court records. And uh, the attendant had asked the passenger to fasten her seatbelt, stow her tray table, and properly wear her mask during the final descent. The, ma the passenger told law enforcement that she was acting in self-defense, according to court records, and she was charged in federal court with assault and interference with a crew member and the, um, has pled not guilty. As of Tuesday, the Federal Aviation Administration had received 4,941 flights of unruly behavior by passengers, including 3,580 mask-related incidents. The agency has issued more than $1 million in fines. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, interference with a flight crew is, well, it's bad stuff. You can get up to 20 years in prison, not to mention being charged with actually assaulting somebody as well. And the crime is normally gonna be charged in federal court. And let me tell you, normally when you go to federal court, you don't get probation, you're going to prison. Now, I've handled several of these cases and we've been very fortunate 
where everyone has received a misdemeanor. But I'm telling you, I think those days are coming to an end because like anything in life, you get more of what you tolerate. And if you tolerate people breaking the law, you're going to get more people breaking the law because they think there are no consequences to it. It's simple psychology, ladies and gentlemen, but you get more of what you tolerate. And like I said, airline travel is not what it used to be. That's for sure. No glamour anymore. Um, the one thing, and I am a capitalist pig, no doubt, but the only thing that would be good about socialism would be is everyone should have socialized private air travel. Just, just saying, because it can get a little expensive. Anyway, all right, the ultimate theft by deception. Police in Connecticut arrested a woman who allegedly stole more than $600,000 from her husband over two decades, having reportedly convinced the man that he was suffering from Alzheimer's. I think this is what they refer to as gaslighting, right, ladies and gentlemen? So on Wednesday, police in East Haven, Connecticut, arrested Donna Marino on charges of first-degree larceny and third-degree forgery. In March of 2020, the husband, whose name has not been released, and another person came to the police to report the fraud and theft. Police said they found Marino allegedly forged her husband's signature on his pension checks, social security checks, workers' compensation settlements, and other legal documents before depositing funds in a secret bank account without his knowledge. The East Haven police captain, Joseph Murgo, said Marino allegedly fraudulently obtained a power of attorney for her husband by having a friend who is a notary public sign the legal document when her husband was not present and filed taxes in her husband's name. Marino allegedly explained that she was able to hide the fraudulent activities over the years by convincing her husband that he was suffering from Alzheimer's disease and believed this would prevent him from going to the bank, ultimately discover the low balances in his accounts. Now, Marino also told investigators that the money she was allegedly stealing was used to help family members pay for rent, grocery cars, payments, you know, things like that. This, of course, was without her husband's knowledge, and Marino's husband reportedly told police he had no knowledge about his wife's alleged crimes until March of 2019. The man's daughter, also identified as Elena, said that in 2019 she noticed her father's credit score plummet and started to become suspicious. Elena said she saw there was a tax lien on his house and she tried to get in touch with her dad, but her dad's phone was being rerouted to Marino's phone. The husband's mother had Alzheimer's and he was afraid of being diagnosed himself. Elena said that it was very difficult to tell her father what had been happening. She said her father was crying uh, to her asking, so am I broke and do I have Alzheimer's? To which Elena had to reply, no, you don't have Alzheimer's. She's been lying to you. Marino's being held in lieu of $25,000 bond. She has court next week. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't give power of attorneys to anybody, okay? You have to watch those financial stuff. I'm telling you, they watch the financial stuff. And that is the ultimate gaslighting, theft, elder abuse. This woman needs to go to prison. Um, it's a little sad that it took so long for people to notice, but over small amounts over a long period of time, well, those amounts add up. All right, next on the docket. Who could abandon your children and nobody say anything? So a child whose skeletal remains were found in a Houston apartment were reportedly killed by homicidal violence, according to a medical examiner. The cause of death of the children whose bodies was found abandoned in an apartment in Houston has been ruled homicidal violence with multiple blunt force injuries, according to the uh, County uh, Institute of Forensic Science. The child's mother and a boyfriend have been charged after authorities found three young siblings abandoned in the home along with the body of their brother, according to the police. Brian W. Coulter, 31, was charged with murder in the death of an eight-year-old who died in 2020. Uh, police called it a gruesome child abandonment case, and it seemed too horrific to be real. The eight-year-old child is believed to have died around Thanksgiving, according to Sergeant Dennis Wolford, the lead investigator with the Sheriff's Homicide Unit. And the mother, Gloria Williams, 35, was charged with injury to a child by omission, injury to a child causing serious bodily injury, and tampering with evidence involving a human corpse, according to court filings. The bond has been set 
at $900,000. Bond for Coulter has been set at $1 million. And obviously, if they do make bond, yeah, that's right, no contact with the kids or anyone under the age of 17. Now, the sheriff's office said the 15-year-old called authorities and said his brother had been dead for a year and that his body was in the room next to his. The teen said his parents had not lived in the apartment for several months. Now, the skeletal remains were in plain view and weren't concealed in any way, according to the sheriff. Neighbors said the 15-year-old often relied on them for food for himself. However, both of the neighbors said they didn't know there were other children and they never called the authorities because they didn't understand the magnitude of the situation. The apartment was apparently in deplorable condition, according to the police, and there was no furniture, no bedding or blankets. The carpet was dirty and there were roaches and flies in the apartment. Gee, I wonder if that could have anything to do with, I don't know, a de decomposing dead body. Now, when asked why the children didn't call the police earlier, the children said they were in absolute fear. The nine-year-old had an injury to his jaw that he believed to be caused a few weeks ago by Coulter. Uh, the boy will need to have surgery uh, for that injury soon. And Gonzalez said it looked like the 15-year-old had been taking care of his younger siblings the best he could. The two younger children appeared malnourished and showed signs of physical injury. All three were transported to the hospital for treatment. They're now in the emergency custody of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. In May of 2020, three of the children stopped attending school at the uh, school district, according to the director of public relations for the school district. And she said she did not specify which three children were that she was referring to. In 2019, school district officials began a truancy investigation into the mother for one of the children's lack of attendance, but the case was dismissed at the end of 2019-20 uh, school year, according to the district attorney's office. The children did not attend school nor the 2021-2022 school year, and in September 2020, school personnel attempted a home visit in an effort to return the children to school. Well, it, the door knocking the door went completely unanswered. So some more um, candidates for the uh, Parents of the Year Award. We'll definitely have to uh, announce that at the end of the year so the world can know what terrible parents these people are. Of course, we'll give them the presumption of innocence, but we all know the truth, do we not? Finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Enjoy, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. Crime Talk's dumb criminal of the day. Police yesterday arrested Misty Gilly, 50, on felony narcotics charges for allegedly selling fentanyl out of Simply Recovery, the substance abuse treatment facility she operates in Outmore Springs, a city outside of Orlando. Now, Gilly was busted when she allegedly sold fentanyl to a police informant inside the facility. And during a raid Monday at the clinic, police found a backpack containing used needles, a gram of cocaine, and 18 small baggies containing fentanyl. The backpack also contained two prescription bottles with the names Misty Gilly. In the clinic's group's therapy room, investigators found multiple baggies with suspected fentanyl residue in a garbage can. The room, according to the arrest report, was apparently being used for drug use activities. Gilly was free from custody after posting a $49,000 bond and is scheduled to be arraigned on December 7th.